Coming up on this week's show, Alice Winter is here and she's going to talk to us about her series, In Darkness. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 179 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and groovy husband, Will Knaus. Groovy, eh? Groovy, yes. I went with groovy today. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we've got coming up for you next week. So everyone, be sure and stick around for that. We've got lots of great stuff coming up. But first, we want to say thank you. Uh, we reached a particular milestone just this past week. We, re- we reached um, 500 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, that was pretty awesome to hit that milestone. Yeah. Uh, so thank you to everybody who joined us on YouTube to watch us talk about the books that we love and discuss writing with our wonderful group of authors that we have on the show. Mm-hmm. This week, the nominations for the 31st Lambda Literary Awards were announced, and several friends of the podcast were nominated. Uh, Chris Jason was nominated in the gay romance category for Learn With Me. Uh, Christina Lee and Riley Hart were also nominated in the gay romance category for their book Of Sunlight and Stardust. And Marshall Thornton got two nominations in the game mystery category for Boys Town 11, Heart's Desire, and Late Fees, a pink video mystery. Uh, We'll have a link in the show notes so you can check out all of this year's nominees if you would like to add to your TBR. Now, another friend of the podcast and one of our very favorite projects ever, uh, the Promised Land Children's Book. Uh, Those creators have begun a Kickstarter for their third project this week. Uh, The new book is called Ravenwild, and in this book we meet uh, a reckless young boy named Hawk who transitions into the courageous young woman named Raven. Uh, Raven rescues an injured bird, and when she does this, she learns of an evil poacher's plan to steal a precious gem that has the power to control all creatures, great and small. Now, on her dangerous jungle quest to stop this, this poacher, Uh, and save an animal kingdom, she forms a connection with a childhood friend named Finn that soon transforms into love. I can't wait to read this book. I'm so (laughs) excited for it. Now, their Kickstarter uh, for the project is going to run in through April 16th. Uh, We have backed this. We've backed all their books so far and really hope you check this out and give it a look to see if it's something you'd like to back as well. And we will have a link for that in the show notes so you can check it out. High school hockey player, computer whiz, covert agent? Theo Reese's life is split between being a normal teenager and a secret agent who goes by the code name Winger. After years of providing mission support from behind his keyboard, he's thrust into an unexpected world of adventure and danger. In Audio Assault, the third thrilling book in the Codename Winger series by Jeff Adams, a family friend needs urgent help. Theo is off to New York City where he uncovers an insidious plot. Popular song files have been modified to steal personal data and emit a tone that drives some listeners into a homicidal rage. Theo races against the clock to stop the music from causing worldwide chaos. Anna at Gay Book Reviews says, The twists the plot took were so unexpected and exciting that I just couldn't put it down. Get Audio Assault, an ebook or paperback at Amazon and other online retailers. So the first book I want to talk about this week is American Dreamer by Adriana Herrera. This book could have easily been titled The Food Truck Chef and the Librarian. And if that doesn't automatically make you want to like one click this book, then you might as well keep on moving because nothing I'm about to say is going to convince you to try this phenomenal romance. So Nesto is our food truck owner and he's relocated his business from New York City to upstate New York and he pours like every ounce of his passion into the Afro-Caribbean food that he serves uh, until that his certain other passions are stirred by Jude and he is the librarian of our story. 
Their attraction is like instantaneous, and their chemistry is obvious to everyone around them, but our heroes take things um, relatively slow, despite well-meaning nudging from uh, family and friends. You see, not only are they passionate about one another, um, Nesto is determined to make uh, his business a success, and Jude is focused on getting funding for a countywide bookmobile project. Um, they both have lives beyond the romantic story arc of the book, and um, hoity toity literary snobs would probably call Nesto and Jude, you know, dimensional characters because they have depth. All I know is that I care about them because they are real to me, in my heart, in my mind, and it's just something that goes beyond words on a page. Uh, several times throughout the story, life throws various obstacles in their path, but every time they rise to the occasion. And truthfully, it would take like a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown of the entire story for me to explain how much I love Nesto and Jude, and how through their actions they overcome their obstacles, both romantic and business-related. It's one thing for an author to tell us if a character is romantic or heroic, it's another thing entirely when we're shown that romance and that heroism in their actions that occur during the story. Nesto and Jude are good men. We know this because we experience it time and again in the book and we root for them because of it. Something I want to uh, make note of really quickly is, is that around the 75%, 80% mark of the book, um, Nesto and Jude say their I love yous. Mm -hmm. And you're probably thinking, well, duh, well, this is a romance. <laughs> of course they say I love you. But the thing is, in most like contemporary romances or category romances, they're all working towards the big single I love you moment when the two characters turn to one another and they say like i choose you and they reach their happy ending then it's like everyone goes ah and then maybe we might have a a, a quick real prologue to to show us you know them you know living in blissful happiness mm -hmm. the thing is is that when we reach the 75 percent and the happiness is essentially on lockdown that's a kind of stressful for the reader because normally that the story is done, but in this particular case, um, Nesto and Jude have a whole other mess of problems that they need to solve. And as a reader, you're like, no, no, stop, please, they're happy, no more. <laughs> um, but the story does continue on. Uh, a member of Jude's estranged family is gravely ill and reaches out to him. Uh, Jude gives this person a second chance, although they so don't deserve it, and he is inevitably let down by them. And Jude is emotionally devastated by this, and Nesto is not there for them, even though he promised he would be. And it's up until this point that I felt Nesto was like the living embodiment of a perfect boyfriend, but when he badly screws things up, not maliciously or on purpose, he screws them up because he's human, which like made me love him even more if that were even possible. <laughs> Um, Nesto isn't going to give up without a fight, and he comes up with a like a swoon-worthy grand gesture to win Jude back. And um, it's a really fucking good one, by the way. <laughs> Our heroes achieve their final uh, and very well-deserved happily ever after. Mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> um, I want to quickly recommend episode 341 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. Sarah Wendell has a really fantastic interview with author Adriana Herrera, and they talk about all sorts of things, including the food that's featured in this book. Um, they talk about writing diverse characters and how her job as a social worker influences the way she looks at romance in the books that she reads and writes. It's really fascinating stuff, and I suggest everyone check it out. Uh, we're going to have the link in the show notes for this particular episode. I also want to quickly recommend the audiobook of American Dreamer as read by Sean Crisden. He is like, oh gosh, he's like <laughs> he literally one of my absolute favorite narrator narrators, and he does a, a exceptional job with this book, especially the various dialects of the ethnically diverse cast of characters. So, if, in summation, <laughs> I want to say if you want to read a kick-ass debut novel, get this book. If you crave genuine diversity in romance, you should get this book. And if you want likable, relatable heroes to fall in love with, get this book. Yes, everything he just said. <laughs> because I've read this book also, and I... 
adored it. Yep. Uh, something, uh, a few points that you said, uh, something that really struck me as you were going through this. You talked about like, there's this whole big plot that happens that's outside of the romance between the food truck and the bookmobile and everything that goes with it. And I think that's why I like this book. Well, one of the many reasons I like this book so much, because it reminded me of some of the romantic suspense books I read where there is such a juicy plot that happens Mm -hmm. adjacent to the romance. Mm -hmm. There's nothing suspenseful about this in that same way, but it's, it's just all that meat that is there running alongside the romance that I just, I loved about this book. Uh, to pick up on a couple other things that I really liked, I loved the cast of supporting characters here. Uh, Nesto's crew of friends that come up to Ithaca with him to help him realize his food truck dreams, they they put their New York laws on hold for a little bit to come up to this place to help him. Um, and they really kicked him kicked him in the butt. You said nudge. They kicked him in the butt <laughs> to get him to realize what he had with Jude. Um, and Jude's BFF also... She more nudged. I'll give her a nudge in the right direction to get him to focus a little bit more on Nesto. Um, And speaking of friends, uh, American Fairy Tale, which comes out in May, is going to focus on Nesto's best friend, Milo. And I'm so looking forward to seeing what Adriana brings into book two uh, as she moves the setting back to New York. Uh, There's also an, an underlying story here of prejudice. Uh, Nesto gets really nagged from one of the town's do-gooder, prominent citizen people. Uh, and it's it's a protagonist, um, or an antagonist, rather, for Jude as well in his library work. There are some very uncomfortable scenes here that really highlight some of the terrible ways persons of color can be harassed. And Nesto took a high road approach here, which was totally in line with his character, but I have to say, I was much more with Jude, and I just really wanted to go off on this evil woman. And I was so happy when she got her come up at, at the end. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I totally recommend uh, American Dreamer because it's just so over the top outstanding. Now, at an interesting happenstance this week, we have two books that focus on food trucks, <laughs> which was just totally out of the blue that it happened this way. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a new young adult book called The Music of What Happens by Bill Konigsberg. Now, I've been a fan of Bill's since he debuted with Out of the Pocket back in 2008. He's a major inspiration for me, not only for the types of young adult characters he creates, but his, his just talent as a storyteller. These two elements blend together so perfectly in The Music of What Happens. Max and Jordan are 17 and opposites in every possible way, but boy, do these opposites attract. Max is chill, pretty much a jock dude, plays baseball, plays video games, cracks crude jokes with his buddies. He's out to his mom and these close friends, but not really beyond that. Jordan is far from chill. He's stressed that his mom hasn't been the same since his dad died. He loves to write poetry. He's got two great girlfriends who he often refers to as his quote unquote wives. Uh, Jordan and his mom resurrect the food truck his dad owned because they have to do something to pay the mortgage on the house or they will be homeless in a month. Max comes into Jordan's life as he goes from being a food truck customer to the food truck chef. Not everybody gets to make that kind of transition, but it happens. Max loves to cook, and since he needs a job for the summer, he's willing to help out. Jordan's mom is all too happy to hand this entire operation over to the boys, and you can imagine that this is probably not the best choice to make. But the two pull together, get the truck working, including a very loose interpretation, I have to say, of what organic and locally sourced ingredients mean, uh, which is often, you know, Safeway. Uh, (laughs) They learn more about each other, of course, as this happens. Max, for example, discovers that Jordan has a a really good knack for writing poetry, and Max ultimately reveals himself to be an artist. As the relationship grows and the food truck actually begins to succeed, Max and Jordan also help each other to find their true best selves. Jordan ends up and teaches Max about what he likes to call hooligan do-goodery. Uh, which is where a random act of disruptive kindness happens. And Max actually shows Jordan the advantages to working out and how it can kind of help you de-stress from what's going on in life. Through all this, they fall in love. 
even though neither can quite believe they're falling for their really diametrically opposed selves. Now, there's a lot of tough issues that they have to deal with, too. Max's father has taught him that he must always warrior up and never cry, never show weakness, smile and agree with everything just to kind of get through the hard times. Supermax, as Max often refers to himself, can't get him through everything, though. A random hookup that he had with a college boy uh, really haunts him to a breaking point here. And Jordan's home life has a lot of major cracks as well as his mom continues to spiral and he doesn't know what to do. And Jordan doesn't realize exactly how much is at stake here until it's way too late. Bill pulls no punches in this book as he touches on so many things. You've got the loss of a parent, a parent's inability to, t to care for a child when their own world is really falling apart. There's a, a rape storyline that is just devastating. The tolls of toxic masculinity, masculinity and what that can mean for young men. Racism. There, there's a lot here. But I also want to emphasize that it's not all heavy. Bill has a vivid story about the joy of falling in love with the right person and the strength that can be found in family and good friends. Most of all, this book is about finding your true self, embracing it, and not hiding it. I do have to give kudos to narrators here. Uh, Joel Frumkin, of course, who we all know it from the MM romance genre as Joel Leslie, and Anthony Ray Perez do an amazing job here. Uh, I've long loved Joel's work, and here he is in excellent form. He taps into Jordan's joys, sorrow, and fears, while also giving great characterization to his BFFs. Anthony's voicing of Max revealed so much of the character's self-doubt, even while he portrayed Supermax to the world. Like Joel, Anthony also brought Max's friends to full life. Uh, each narrator gets major props for handling each boy's emotional scenes. Jordan with the collapse of his family, and Max coming to terms with the fact that he'd been raped. Uh, it's powerful perfection from these two. So I highly recommend Bill Koenigsberg's The Music of What Happens, and especially the audio version if you're into audiobooks. Now, breaking away from our food truck motif, um, <laughs> I really quickly wanted to talk about my ongoing Max Walker obsession. Uh, I recently did the audiobook of A Tangled Truth, which is the third book in the Stonewall Investigation series, once again narrated by Greg Brudeau. Uh, it's well documented the last few weeks that I have loved each of the Stonewall Investigations books. But this one, with a second chance romance with involving friends to lovers is my favorite so far. You would love this book for that very trope that's here. <laughs> Ooh, one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. The ripped from the headline story also hooked me. We've got Liam Wolf, who's a successful Hollywood director who finds himself accused of embezzlement, harassment, and just other things that he would never do. He has a pretty good idea who's behind the character assassination, but he needs help to prove it. Stonewall detective Mark Masters has his world rocked when Liam walks into his office for help. Liam and Mark haven't seen each other since they were teens growing up in New York City. They'd been inseparable, but when Liam moved, they lost touch. Their friendship picks up as if they'd never been apart, and Mark eagerly takes on Liam's case to find out who's behind trying to destroy his career. The case leads Mark all over New York City and even out to L.A. to sort it out. Signs point to a prominent homophobic producer who has been very public that he doesn't like working with Liam. But, as always in Max's books, the truth is shocking and not what it seems to be that, or what you'd expect it. Uh, I hadn't anticipated the twist uh, with the way that the case would work itself out. And, as usual, Max Max's ability to create these tight, unrelenting mysteries just had me like eager to keep going. I will say he didn't make me late for work this time. I was very careful on how to pace my reading here. Uh, the romance between Liam and Mark was so beyond sweet. Their reacquaintance was wonderful as they reaccounted their past exploits and caught up on the intervening years. Max really captured what it's like for best friends who are separated for years, but then fall right back with each other like no time had passed. The feelings they had as teenagers came back, too, and boy, this time did they act on those. There was none of that tentative stuff that you might have from teenage boys. Uh, but they also worked through some of the baggage that they carried from their teens. 
Mark and Liam, they're so freaking cute. You would love them. You need to read this book. <laughs> um, the reminiscences they shared were very sweet, and and how some of those carried forward just made me swoon. They the visit they made to a childhood diner in particular made me so very happy. Uh, and Liam's got some family issues going on too, and his re- reuniting with Mark. Uh, help take that bittersweet moment and not only deepen their relationship, but really help Liam uh, come to terms with some of what was happening there. Um, there are some crushing events in this book. Uh, to me, far more than it happened in the previous books, but Max just weaves those so flawlessly into the story. I gasped, I cried. Uh, this boom, Max is such a good storyteller here. Now, the unicorn killer who's surfaced in all the books so far really takes a toll in this installment, uh, far more than we've seen in the previous books. That storyline is front and center in the recently released book number four, which is called A Lover's Game. Max, you got to get this audio out, because I don't think I could do it without Greg Brudeau's narration, but I also really need to know what happens in that book. So make that happen sooner, please. Anyway, I highly, highly recommend all of Stonewall Investigations but very much so A Tangled Truth, which is book number three by Max Walker. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. Kind of appropriate we ended the last segment with the romantic suspense of Max Walker because now we're going to get into the romantic suspense of Alice Winters. Uh, this one I discovered because Joel Leslie uh, pr- put the first In Darkness book in front of me and said, you need to read this. And sure enough, it was amazing. Uh, she's recently released the third book in that series called Deception in Darkness. Uh, you'll hear it referred to in this interview simply as the third book because when we talked to her, it didn't have a title yet. <laughs> so yeah, we'll definitely have a, a link for Deception and Darkness in the show notes. And uh, yeah, I had a great time listening to Alice and how all this uh, came to pass in her writing career. So shall we get to that? Yeah. Welcome Alice Winters to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to get to talk to you because I got so in to your In Darkness series with Hidden in Darkness. Joel Leslie recommended it to me uh, when the audio dropped. I listen to anything that he tells me I need to listen to, and this was right on the mark. For folks who don't know what the In Darkness series is about, tell us all about it. Um, it's basically about, uh, my main character's name is Felix, and he is hired to help take care of a man named Lane who has recently been blinded. And uh, he's kind of not really the perfect person for the job. He's a little snarky and, and, you know, he makes a lot of jokes and stuff. And, um, but he actually kind of helps, helps Lane a little bit because Lane has kind of fallen into depression and, and he's used to being out in the action and doing things. And suddenly now he can't, feels like he can't even leave the house. He feels like he can't do anything. So Felix kind of steps in and, and gets him to open up a little bit that way. Um, Felix kind of learns that there's more to what happened to Lane and, and that Lane is actually an undercover cop and, and suddenly just drags Felix into this whole uh, scenario with a bunch of stuff going on. And um, Felix has kind of um, always been, had a little darker of a upbringing. So he kind of fits in a little bit with it. And he's a little bit of a petty thief as well. So they kind of end up working together like that. And, the books are kind of, you can't take them too seriously. I think some people go in thinking that they're going to be uh, super serious action. And and you can't, Felix and Lane just get into situations that wouldn't be realistic in a regular book. And they, uh, Felix finds a way to make everything ridiculous and fun. And Lane just is there for the action. And, and he wants to not be held back by his blindness. He wants to still be able to do the things that he was able to do as a cop, even though he really can't anymore. 
And Felix tries his hardest to kind of give him those opportunities to still be able to do that, but then put his own little Felix twist on things. That's one of the things I liked so much about the book is I've gotten really into romantic suspense like over the last year. And a lot of them are quite serious and deservedly so because, you know, usually Mm -hmm. somebody's in peril or multiple people are in peril. And then here you do have snarky, kind of sarcastic, kind of fearless, most of the time, Felix, who keeps nudging Lane out of his comfort zone to get the stuff done. And somehow keeping it all very, I won't say light and fluffy, but there are that there is those moments of like breaking the tension that I think only Felix can do. Yeah, I agree. Cause um, I think Felix just, he makes everything like more jokes. So even if it's like a, a heavier topic, he always has to kind of put his side on it or his spin on it. And, and then he loves to run into things that he really shouldn't be doing. And he always admits that he has no idea what he's doing, but he's still going to do it anyways. And I think that's kind of how he gets into all his issues. And Although I think he knows more than he really thinks he does. <laughs> I, I agree. He's, he's street smart. I think that yeah. kind of helps him out with things. And, you know, he grew up kind of having to take care of himself. So he knows how to do these things and knows how to do... Although he's usually a little bit on the other side of the law because, you know, he used, he grew up stealing things and, and taking care of himself that way. Where Lane, obviously, he was a cop, so he kind of um, is a little, agrees doing, always wants to do things better or pick the better option. What was your inspiration to the series to come up with these two very diverse and divergent characters? a good question but i don't i don't really know what made me think of this i actually started these books uh, maybe like two or three years ago and i started the first one and i wrote about 20 pages on it and i set it to the side and i don't know if i ever plan on picking it up again um when i did pick it up i kind of made it a little less serious he looks a little goofier laying a less not as serious than everything and it just kind of it felt right then and i just went with it that's very cool kind of i I like the organic kind of growth it sounds like that that had Mm -hmm. now you've got a third book coming up in march uh what do we have to look forward to with with lane and felix this time out well in the second book felix ends up stealing a watch and because he's good at these things where he can steal things from people and that's what he enjoys doing so he ends up stealing a watch and it basically kind of comes back to bite him in the butt and so him and lane are kind of pulled into a whole new situation dealing with trying to get this watch back and trying to kind of amend things but then they end up getting pulled into something even even further And then we have Lane who, well, Felix kind of in the second book talks a little bit about how he would be perfectly fine, you know, just sitting at home and having a regular life with Lane. Lane still is eager for that action that he used to have being an undercover cop and he still really wants to do those type of things. So Lane's always jumps on the action and Felix just follows along. Not many cops can have that kind of assistant on the side. <laughs> it's, I really like how that plays itself out. They talk a little bit in the third book because a lot of people are always always blaming Felix for a lot of the action. And they're like, well, Felix is the one to do it. And I'm like, but if you really think about it, it's actually Lane who's always eager to do these things. But Felix puts his own spin on everything. And, and Lane will suggest, okay, let's go. For example, in the third book, they're, they're trying to steal something and... and Lane's like, let's go steal it. And then Felix ends up putting this random twist on it that ends up, you know, uh, getting them chased by people and and in a shootout and all this type of stuff because of what Felix ends up pulling them into. He he had a knack, even in the first book, of hearing what Lane wanted to do and then going and making it like maybe 10 times worse to get it it done. Yes, that's usually what Felix does. Which is usually his charm, in my view, too. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where most of the 
comic relief comes from is is Felix. Lane's very serious. Now, Lane will joke back with Felix, and I think he doesn't joke as much with the other characters, but I think Felix brings that out in him. Um, but that's kind of where all the comedy more comes from, is from Felix's little antics. Again, I, I keep going back to what I really liked in the book, but I liked how Felix really got Lane to get out of that too serious mode and get him out of his essentially essentially his funk mm-hmm. that he descended himself into from the accident. And, you know, I think the more he embraces that, probably the better for him. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Because, I mean, it'd have to be hard, especially for someone like Lane, to now not be able to really do anything that he, could, he used to be able to do. And then, um, like, there's really not a place for him in the police force anymore because... He's blind now, so he can't be out in the field. He can't be doing these things. So Felix keeps him from falling back into that depression. Mm-hmm. Do you play more in the series now that you're up to a trilogy? I've played around with the idea. I left the end of the third book. I set it up so that there could easily be more. But I like to kind of conclude each story in, in each book so that, you know, if there isn't any more, their story still concluded, but there's obviously room for a whole lot more. I do feel like I will do another book. I just enjoy working with these two characters so much that it's kind of fun to go back to them. Fingers crossed. I have these two books to catch up on, but I know I like these characters. So all I can say is I think the more the merrier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, the In Darkness series was also your first foray into going into audiobooks. Uh, how did that come about? Did you seek those out, or did someone come to you for the licensing? Or uh, They actually came to me about it, and I really had never planned on doing anything with audiobooks at the time. Um, so they reached out and asked if they could do it, and I was, I was super nervous about it because I just felt like, like you kind of have your image of your character in your head and how they sound and how they act that I was really nervous that I would not like hearing Felix out loud. And I told them that I would do it, but as long as I could, okay, the narrator. Mm -hmm. And so they came to me with, um, the first person that they came to me with was, which was Joel. And, um, so I, I listened, I haven't listened to a lot of audiobooks, so I actually didn't know him. So I went through and I listened to some samples that they had given me of him and, And I was still kind of nervous because most of the samples they gave me, Joel wasn't reading, uh, like a, he was reading more of like a dramatic role. Mm -hmm. So I was still uncertain of how he would do with, you know, Felix's banter and things like that. And I don't, I did not get to listen to the audiobook at all before it was published. So I was listening to it as, you know, everybody else was. So that was like my first time listening to it. And I remember listening to about five minutes or so of it. And then I I sent Joel a message and just told him that, that, you know, he obviously did a perfect job with Felix. And he, you could tell he spent a lot of time figuring out how to properly portray some of the jokes and stuff. Because I feel like Felix could, if in the hands of the wrong narrator could come off almost like a little bratty with how his, how he says things and how he does things and, and almost like a little rude in some ways if it's not said properly. But Joel did that perfectly. And I've read the book so many times that like, I don't laugh at, at them as I'm reading them, but I was listening. I listened to both of the audiobooks, and he had me laughing out loud on more than one occasion on how, he was able to depict the lines and stuff like that. That's clearly the sign of a job well done. And, and from yep. Joel, I'm not surprised either. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah, he did an excellent job with Felix. That's really excellent. Uh, can you envision more audiobooks of your work down the line, given the positive experience of this one? Yeah, I would love to, you know, kind of get my hand into more audiobooks and... It'll kind of depend as we go along, but I would love to see more of them as audiobooks. Cool. Is the third book on its? Will, will that be coming on its way, or do you know yet? It will, but it's a little bit down the ways sure. a little bit. Yeah. Joel's very busy. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. 
Now, earlier this year, you also released uh, Within the Mind, another type of romantic suspense book. Um, tell us what to expect with this one, because I'm, I'm intrigued by its premise. Um, that book's a, it's a little bit darker. It's a little more serious in some ways because um, it's about two detectives that have the ability to go into people's memories. And they basically work for the police going into, like, for example, if someone, like, was um, attacked and they were in a coma or something, he can go into their memory and he can um, figure out what happened to this person and he can see exactly what happens and help them find the attacker. Uh, so they end up getting uh, asked by a homicide department to go into the mind of a serial killer. And once they're in the serial killer's mind, they find out things aren't really what they originally thought they were going to be and that the serial killer themselves also has a gift that kind of manipulates these memories. And it sounds super serious, but it also has a lot of humor and banter in it as well to kind of cushion that. And I tried really hard to keep in, keep things from getting too serious or too dark by using the humor in their banter. And the main character, Chevy, he's he's more serious than Felix, and he's a little bit more dry in his humor. But then we have Seneca, who is more lighthearted, and everybody loves him, and he's outgoing. So we kind of have one character that's very shy and one character that's very outgoing, and they kind of they clash but work perfectly together kind of thing. Interesting. Now I'm even more intrigued from having, <laughs> you know, from what I was reading leading into the interview. Uh, is this also going to probably head into series as well with these characters? I would, I, I would like to make this a series. Um, it is my plan at the moment to kind of do more with the characters because I feel like you kind of really only get into the relationship side towards the end of the book. And I feel like because they're working with the police, there's so many different opportunities for them to have, to get involved in cases and and. You know, I really don't delve too much into other people's gifts in it besides the main antagonist. So it'd be fun in, you know, future books to kind of branch out on that type of stuff as well. That's very cool. You mentioned with the In Darkness books that you couldn't really pin down, like, the inspiration behind those characters. Where would you say overall that your inspiration comes from for these for these suspenseful tales and the character you you tend to create? It's a very hard question. I I don't really know. I mean, same with the, I was trying to think of that for Within the Mind as well, what made me think of that. And, and I don't remember. I remember starting the book a couple of years ago. I actually started it with a female protagonist and it was supposed to be more of a horror. And I just couldn't get past page five and it just didn't feel right. It wasn't going anywhere and I just stopped it. I don't, I don't know, usually something inspires me, but I don't really, can't really remember for either of those what made me think of it. You mentioned for both of the, for a couple of these things now that, you know, you, you put in darkness away for a while and you just mentioned this female protagonist when you were in like a few pages and stopped. Is your process more around outlining or just kind of writing and see where it takes you? I usually just write and see where it takes me. I usually can just um, just kind of jump into a book. Those were really the only ones I've written recently that I had kind of set away for a while and jumped back into. Usually, if I kind of have an idea, I can go into it and just start writing. But I like to only write one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So, like, within the mind, I had started that while I was writing a different series. And I kind of just had the idea in my head and I wanted to get a few pages down and so I did and then I was like well I'll get back to it when I'm done with the book I'm currently working on and then I just never did I never got back to it I kind of moved on to something else I, I easily get excited to start another book and then I just jump into it and go and I try not to write too much like I'm not good at writing two things at the same time I like to just focus on one book and I'm intrigued that you can do these suspenseful mystery books and not plot it more out. I think that would stress me out a little bit if I didn't know how, at least how the mystery part was going to kind of play itself out. Yeah. 
sometimes I kind of have a good idea in mind and like in darkness three I just went into it and I had for a lot of it I had no idea where I was going with it and then it just kind of fell into place I usually get to that point where like I have an idea and then I just kind of have to sit and think about it for a while and and then you know I can go from there but I usually just jump into the book usually I know I know who the characters are and a few main scenes that I want to hit in it before I get started. That is super cool. I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a little origin story. So what led you into writing and, and coming into MM Romance? I think I started writing when I was a lot younger because my mom wrote a little bit. She doesn't write anymore, but she wrote a little bit. And of course, I wanted to do what she was doing. So um, I used to play on her old typewriter and write out stories that way. And then I just kind of got addicted to it from there. And I mean, I had hundreds of notebooks that I used to. I was horrible at not paying attention in school. I was just the person just sat in the back and wrote in my notebooks the whole time. And as with the romance aspect of it, um, I feel like I've always kind of written from a male's perspective. I've tried to write a few books from a female uh, point of view, but I never finished them. I don't know if I have a single book that I've finished with a female protagonist. But I've always kind of been like that. Even like when I play video games and stuff, I always pick the male protagonist. And maybe kind of what led me to like the MM part of it is like, I was kind of like, always felt I was a little bit strange, never really wanting to date anybody or relationships with anybody. And like back in high school, I started to kind of resent like male, female romance in books. And because it's like, that was what was normal. And I felt like I wasn't normal and I needed to be normal. And I started to resent that kind of side of it. And I don't know if that's kind of just what pulled me into it. And it's like now that I'm older, I just accept myself for who I am. I don't feel like I need to, you know, label myself as anything or fit into whatever category other people think I should fit into and I'm more comfortable that way. And so this stuff doesn't bother me as much anymore. But I feel like back in high school and stuff, I, I really had that kind of issue. And that's really when I started writing this, you know, these type of romances. Mm -hmm. I like that it goes back that many years for you. I mean, that, that's very cool. What sent you down the romantic suspense path? I will literally write just about any genre. Um, I kind of have to have some type of plot, though. Mm. I, I don't think I could write, like, a full romance. Maybe, like, a novella I could, but I just I feel like I have to have some type of plot, like, pushing the book forward. So it doesn't nearly like really have to be the suspense. I've you know I've I have like a fantasy and stuff that I've wrote and any type of that stuff. But I just like I don't know. I just like the the action pushing it and like that type of the plot. I kind of like to have plot as part and then the romance as part and kind of combine them together. Mm -hmm. So really, you might branch off into any other genre just as inspiration strikes and you find the right plot and the right characters to do it with. Yeah, I feel like I would. I don't, I get bored very easily just writing like the same type of thing. It's, it's just it with like, I just, the people that can write like a series of 10 where they kind of like, and like do cases every time. Like, I think that's awesome, but I don't know if I could do it. I feel like I would, I kind of get bored of it and have to move and do something completely different. Mm -hmm. What would you say the trademark of an Alice Winters book is? I feel like most people would say it'd be the banter between my characters. Like even my more serious books, I still kind of enjoy that banter and that dialogue. I love a book with dialogue in it. And I feel like my books are very heavy on the dialogue. I generally... When I write a book, I probably write too much dialogue and not enough description. And I generally have to go back and actually describe what people look like and where they're at and what they're doing because I love the dialogue. I could I could write dialogue all day long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of that way, too. It's like I, I, I populate the scene later. Let's write the write the exactly. dialogue because that's that's the that's the fun and easy part in a lot of ways. <laughs> it is. Yeah. What do you like to read when you're not writing? 
I'll read just about anything. I do like, I do like the thrillers. I do like comedy, uh, fantasy. I, I literally, if it has a excellent character in it, I'll read just about anything. It, I'm not super picky when it comes to those type of things. I do like, I do like a unique character that kind of stands out. And like I said, I do like a lot of good dialogue in books. Some books are very descriptive heavy and, and I feel like I kind of, my attention kind of wanders sometimes on things like that. But um, a book with a good character and good fun dialogue between them and stuff really stands out to me. What's coming up for you for the rest of this year uh, after the new uh, In Darkness book comes out? Um, I plan to have another book out maybe around April. Um, I like to kind of release something maybe every other month for the rest of the year and kind of just go from there. I'm not yet sure what I'm releasing. I'm just kind of taking it a little bit at a time, but that's my plan for the rest of this year. That's exciting to churn out six books in a year. Yes. And I'm hoping it all all works out well. But I have an awesome team now that's kind of helping me and my editors and my my editor and my beta readers and some stuff like that. So I feel like I'm finally at this point where I can I can do things like that. Mm-hmm. What's the best way for everyone to keep up with you online to you know keep track of what's coming coming later this year? I have a reader group on Facebook, which is Alice Winter's Wonderland. Um, and then I also have a newsletter that they can access to my website, which is alicewintersauthor.com. Perfect. We will link up to all that in the show notes, as well as the books we've talked about. Wish you so much success with this third in darkness book. And I'm looking forward to reading it. I think I'm going to have to wait for Joel to do it, though, because I think I need him to read it to me. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Thanks again to Alice for spending some time with us. Uh, besides those In Darkness books I need to catch up on, I'm definitely going to be checking out Within the Mind because that just that struck me as a really awesome book mm-hmm. as well. Okay, everyone, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Just a quick reminder before we go, um, the Big Gay Fiction Podcast has its very own Patreon page. Now, Patreon is a way for fans to engage with all kinds of artists, you know, writers, musicians, and podcasters as well. It's a great way to support the kinds of creative content that you enjoy most. And if you're curious about what kind of bonus material we deliver to our fans every month, just go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Now, coming up next week, uh, Jason Gaffney and Kevin Held will return, and they're going to talk about the book and upcoming film adaptation of Out of Body, as well as their podcast, The Bright Side. Yes, it was great talking to them. Uh, We did it a few weeks ago, back when they were here for that bonus episode, and they're actually shooting Out of Body right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so much to look forward to next week. Okay, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.